Good morning, everybody. Um, want to thank everybody who's on this call. We have like 185 screens from what I can tell, 186 screens. So thank you for your love of our beloved Eretz Yisrael and your concern for Israel in these very scary and troubled times. Want to thank, of course, Amy and Brian for making this possible again, uh, relationally and technologically, bringing all of us together. And most of all, we want to thank Micha. Uh, you are our constant uh, friend and guide and Sherpa when it comes to helping us understand Israel. You were with us in December, December 18th. You're going to be with us in person again uh, on, um, on March 20th. And this morning, uh, all of us woke up to, you know, to read about Joe Biden's 46 words to Prime Minister Netanyahu. Thomas Friedman quoted these words. Uh, I think I've gotten 4,000 emails from every member of the congregation sending me Biden's 46 words, but they speak to how urgent this time is. And there is no one we would rather have interpreted for us than you. So Micha, take it away and deep gratitude for being with us again. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. It's great being with you all, with people that are my friends and friends of Israel and very concerned. And we're concerned for very good reasons because this moment is a different moment. It has a very different quality to it. We never had this kind of a debate. 75 years almost Israel exists. And we never had this kind of a debate. It's a different kind of a debate. It has different energy and has different content. And here's the thing. We're not debating policy. We're not debating the conflict, Palestinians, manage the conflict, end the conflict shrink the conflict. I think we know what, what the better idea here is, but that's not what we're debating. We're not debating taxes, we're not debating VAT, we're not debating religion and state, we're not debating the railing, what, we're not debating any policy question here. So this is the first time I remember we're debating something else completely. We're debating the structure of our regime. The difference between debating the structure of the regime or debating the policies that are born out of that regime is a, is a tremendous difference. It's like, it's like the difference between debating, having an argument about like co the constitution is how I try, try to understand this lately. The constitution is the rules of the game and legislation is the game itself. So in politics, people always compete over power. They're powers to promote their ideas. And when you achieve, obtain power to promote your ideas, you do it through the process of legislation. And that's the game. That's the game of politics. That's the game that many people, that every country has and participates in. The game over power, the game over the power to legislate. Constitution is the rules of the game. So there's two different kinds of debates. We can have debates over the game or over the rules of the game. It'll be like a very different nature. For example, let's say we're playing basketball and I have an idea of a certain strategy we should use to defeat the other team in basketball. And someone else has a different idea of a different strategy using a different, a different trick in basketball, and we're arguing about it. That would be an arguing about how to play the game. But we would never argue about the rules of the game, like what's the height of the basket, what's the weight of the basketball, what is considered dribbling. We don't argue about the rules of the game. It's the opposite. Because we agree on the rules of the game, we could argue about how to play the game. So that's, I think, the difference between constitution, the rules of the game, and legislation, the game itself. So when Israel, we were arguing about the game for 75 years, and suddenly we're arguing about the rules of the game. Now, why is it that we're suddenly arguing not about the game, but the rules of the game? Not about a specific law, but about, the, but about how do we create laws to begin with? What's our constitution? So, so here's the thing. Israel is a very weird country, and it's it's hard to emphasize how weird we are. We don't have a constitution. Now, there's only three democracies in the world that don't have a constitution, and that is Israel, England, and New Zealand. Now, New Zealand, it's a it's a beautiful country. I love New Zealand. They don't have any. I mean, they don't have any real serious problems in New Zealand. The problems that create heated public debate about policies about sheep and how, and how they might be a threat to the environment, like that's the level of, of, of political debate in New Zealand. England doesn't have a constitution, it has something even better. It ha doesn't have a written constitution, it has an oral constitution, it has an ancient 
tradition, starting from going back to the Magna Carta. Let's think about this, all, let's put this all together. Israel is the only democracy in the world that has big problems, has no tradition because we're a new country and no written constitution. That's who we are. Now, in America, your story is first of all, you got together and created the constitution and then the American democracy was born. I think it's fair to say that the American constitution gave birth to the American democracy. Here we are in a different situation, Israel, in a reverse situation. If in your country and all over the world, the constitution gives birth to the democracy, in Israel, we have a democracy that needs to give birth to a constitution. But here's the problem. In a debate over the constitution, the constitution, the, the debate is a game. The constitution is the rules, are the rules of the game. So I have a question. How do we have a debate over the rules of the game? Or let's put it differently. What are the rules of the game that we participate in when we decide the rules of the game? How do we do that? No one knows. Let's, let's, I'll just bring it back. Now, this is why Israel is interesting and this is why Israel is weird. And maybe this will help us understand why this moment is very different. So in 18, sorry, in 1787, oh, by the way, I just wanna make, say something. I'm not used to speaking, speaking, thinking about these issues in English. So I might not pronounce some of the, I might not use the words correctly. So one, forgive me and two, feel free to correct me because I need to know how, I need to get this right. So, so forgive me for this. So in 18, so in 1787, am I right? You, you, you all, you all, that's all of you Americans went to Philadelphia and you can, there was the, uh, the, the, um, the, um, the, 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 the uh, Constitutional Conference, right? Is that how you call it? The Constitutional Conference in Philadelphia, right? And they drafted the Founding Fathers, drafted a constitution. They ratified it in suppose, so nine out of the 13 states. You had a constitution. And then the story of democracy began. That's how ever since following the American model, that's how every democracy begins. You start with the constitution, and then you form your democracy. And it makes sense because first you all have to agree on the rules of the game. And once you know the rules of the game, you start playing the game. Here's what happened in Israel. <laughs> we, in 1948, when Israel was formed, we couldn't get our act together for good reasons, by the way, and agree on the rules of the game. We couldn't agree on the constitution. So this is like what we kind of said to each other. You know what? Let's just start playing the game. We, we, don't, we, don't agree. we don't know what the rules of the game are. We never agree on the rules of the game. We have no written constitution. But you know what? Let's just start playing the game anyway. And that's weird. How can you play the game without everybody knowing what are the rules of the game? So it's like we kind of said, we said, you know what? Let's just start playing the game without with legislation and politics and competing over power without us knowing the rules of the game. And let's see if it works. And I think they were thinking like, something like, you know what? It will work until it doesn't work anymore. And you know what? They were right. It worked. It worked until it didn't work anymore. And you know what, what was the moment where it stopped working? Now, now is that moment. We decided it will work until it won't work. And here it is. This is how it looks like. It doesn't work anymore this is how it, this, this this is this is how it all happened in um the first elections to the israeli knesset were not elections to the knesset they were elections for a constitutional conference what we call in hebrew we went to vote in the end of 48 or the beginning 49 i'm not sure we went to vote to elect people who represent us in our constitutional conference and they were supposed to draft a constitution that will give birth to the Israeli democracy. So, they, so we went to elect the Asefa Mechonenet, and then Ben Gurion said, you know what? Oh, 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 the plan was once they draft a constitution, and once they ratify the constitution, and once you build all the institutions, so that conference disappears. We go to elections, we elect the first Knesset, and we start, we know the rules of the game, we start playing the game, 
But here's what they actually did. They got together back then and they said, you know what, let's not create a constitution. And even though we were elected to create a constitution, let's just say we're the first Knesset, we'll just start legislating. That's what they did. When I say they, I mean one very specific person, David Ben-Gurion. Begin was against this. Others were against this. Ben-Gurion had, and by the way, he made an important argument. He said, the constitution of the Jewish state needs to be, this is a constitution for the Jewish state. The problem is the majority of Jews aren't here yet. This was 1948. There were 600,000 people here. Only less than a tenth of world Jewry, much less than a tenth of world Jewry. Let's wait for the Jews to come and then we'll have a constitution. That was one interesting idea of Ben Gurion. There was, an, uh, there was something else happening. The state is just born. We need to be flexible. We need to, by the way, within four years, absorb a wave of immigration of more than of 800,000 Jews. We're only 600,000. We have to more than double our size in four years. Imagine the United States of America needs to double its size after bringing 300 million immigrants in four years. Would you survive that? And that's wealthy America, poor Israel, third world country Israel, where the majority of people came from third world countries and after the Holocaust and after a war of independence, broke from the war in those impossible conditions toward the double its size in three or four years. And we did it. We pulled very, Israel is a miracle. But David McGurian said, we have to be very flexible in a constitution that will make us less flexible because there's rules of how we play the game. But we can't have rules. We have to play a very, very a radically elastic game in order to pull this off. So those are the reasons why David Ben, and, and cynics would say, of course he didn't want a constitution. Constitution limits his power. He was in power. He didn't want a constitution. That's the, that, those are the cynical voices. But in any case, that's the history. So the first election was supposed to elect our constitutional conference. And instead of that, it just elected the first Knesset and we started playing the game without knowing the rules of the game. As a result, we're now in a very embarrassing moment. We're having a heated public debate over the rules of the game, but this debate is not regulated by any rules of any game. That, this is why this moment might become very, very scary. I'll address that later on. But also, it could be very promising. I'll also address that later on. Now what I'd like to do is the following. To understand this debate, um, my best way to understand this debate, the only way I understand, I know how to, how to explain a public heated debate that's tearing Israel apart today, is to present both sides and both sides. And by the way, while I'll be presenting both sides, I'll be presenting a lot of history, uh, presenting both sides and trying to give both sides their best arguments. And I know, and this is not easy because I'm sure many of you have many strong views, but I, I wanna ask everyone that's here, let's do this Talmudically, Talmudically, which means to learn with empathy both sides of this debate, both arguments, not because we wanna be persuaded by both, because we want to understand the entire argument, the entire debate, we have to understand where both sides are coming from. So I'll start with the right and then I'll move to the left. And then we'll ask where this is taking us. Okay, is that fair, Rabbi? Is that fair? Okay, so I want to explain where this reform is coming from. It's coming from a sense, there's a lot of vengeance, and there's a sense that we have, we're creating now a counter-revolution. And it's a counter-revolution because it has to balance a former revolution. What was the former revolution? Okay, so to understand the former revolution, you have to understand a process has been happening in Israel in the past 40 years. If you won't understand this process and we won't be able to understand why this process made a lot of people very angry and now all that anger has accumulated and turned into this very radical reform led by Minister Yali Levy. So what has happened in the past 40 years in Israel? What's the following process? The process where the judicial branch, I think you, you say that correctly, I'm saying that correctly, the judicial branch has expanded its power beyond its natural and formal and legitimate boundaries. And it's a process that has two parts to it. In the 1980s, there was part one where the judicial branch started to um, uh, implement, pop, started to, I, I don't wanna say take over because that sounds too brutal, 
but started to be highly, highly involved in the decisions of the executive branch. I'm trying to say certain decisions of the government are not legal. Other decisions of the, of the government are not reasonable and therefore not legal. There was, now the process of this intervention is very interesting. I won't go into this, but I think it's fair to say that through, um, I would say two components, through two elements. One, our attorney general becoming, um, becoming into the 90s a very powerful figure because the advice of the attorney general to the government, telling the government what the decision is legal, what is not legal, trans changed its status dramatically. And I think it's the only attorney general in the world that has that kind of status where its advice is not advice about what's legal. His advice itself became the law. With his advice itself was seen in the Supreme Court as the law. So if the attorney general says to the, a certain minister, listen, you can't do that because I don't think that's not, that's legal. That's not advice. That's an instruction. And if the minister violates his instruction, he's violating the law itself. So it's interesting how this happened. I won't go into it, but that, that what that means is that the attorney general um, is, um, um, has more power than the ministers. And some say, some say more than the prime minister because he could decide that any decision that anybody makes is illegal. Oh, and there is another element here. Um, what happens if it's an issue that the law says nothing about? He's not saying, okay, that decision of the government, I'm comparing it to a law legislated by the Knesset. And uh, when I compare it, I realize, well, that decision is not legal. What happens if there's no law of the Knesset defining the decision of the government is illegal? Even then, the attorney general could say, well, it's extremely not reasonable. And if it's not reasonable, it's seen by the Supreme Court as not legal. So this process, by making something not reasonable, extremely not reasonable, illegal, one, and turning the advice of the attorney general into advice that has legal authority, put that together, that means the attorney general can make decisions that any decision of the government is, is, is not reasonable. That's what he thinks. And as a result, de facto, it's illegal. And that is the, the uh, and so you, so you criminalize the, um, the um, uh, intuitions of ministers in the government. You're saying, well, well, what you thought was not reasonable and therefore not legal. So now, the, the, and the problem is, according to, this, to, according to this side of the debate, is that the attorney general, the Israeli form of the attorney general, uh, was never elected. And if he has more power than the ministers, so that means that power shifted from the ministers that were elected to the attorney general that was never elected. So that is robbing the people from their will. They wanted those ministers. And now the attorney general that was never elected is robbing them from their power. So he's actually robbing the people from their power. Okay, that is one part of it. The second part of it happens in the 1990s. This is more extreme. The uh, Supreme Court started intervening not only in decisions of the government, making saying they're not legal through the attorney general, but it all, not only through one of the processes, was through the, one of the channels of the attorney general, the Yoetza Mishpatira Menshala. What happened in the 1990s, it started also intervening in decisions of the legislative branch. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, the Knesset, which means it started saying certain laws are illegal. Why? They're not constitutional. Hey, but Israel has no constitution. How could the Supreme Court say that? So this is the interesting part. In 19, not in, so, so to understand this, we have to go back to 1950, 1949 or 50. Remember I told you the first class it was supposed to create a constitution and it didn't? Well, it, when it did it something else, it says, you know what, We're, we'll create a committee. And that committee of MKs, of members of our parliament, will create the constitution. It's called the Va'adat Chuka Chok Venishpat. And what can they could do is, they'll start designing the constitution and every chapter of the Constitution will be legislated as a basic law. Okay. Um, so we started legislating basic laws, like a basic law defining the authority of the Knesset. Another basic law defining the authority of the military. A basic law defining the authority of um, Nesia Medina, the president of Israel, like, like Buzi Herzog. It wasn't clear that these basic, all these basic laws, so, and the, the, the idea was that one day all these basic laws are you put together canonized as a part of Israel's constitution. One day when the Mashiach comes, we'll do that. In the meantime, we just have these basic laws. What's the difference between a regular law and a basic law? No one knew. The main difference was 
that it, this is called the basic law. This is called the regular law. That's the only difference. The base, the different, a basic law is different because it's called the basic law. The reason why it doesn't, it seems like there's no difference between the two is because the process that the Kesha has to go through to legislate a regular law is the exact same process they have to go through to legislate a basic law. You have to have a majority and you have a law. So if it's the same process, basic, like in America to create, a, 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 to change the constitution, I think you need two thirds of, of the Senate, two thirds of the house. And then I think 75% of, state, of the states to agree on it, right? And that's a very different process to change, to create something in the constitution than you have just to legislate a regular law. Those are different processes because obviously the constitution has to have more weight because you use the constitution to cancel a regular law. But in Israel, a basic law and a regular law have the exact same process of creation. So, so what are the status of the basic laws? So in night, so this is a long short. I'm saying it very shortly. In 1992, the Knesset legislates for the first time a basic law that doesn't design the authority or describe the authority of certain institutions. It describes the basic human rights that should be protected by law. Only by 1992 we start legislating our Bill of Rights. By the way, our rights were protected, but there was no law protecting them until 1992, and it was called the basic law. But it wasn't passed by a by any massive majority. It was actually the amount of MKs that participated participated at the moment they voted for that law was, I think, less than sixty. Less than half of the Knesset participated at the moment where they legislated the basic law of it's called Chok Yesod Kvod Adam the basic law of human dignity and um, and liberty. Um, so only sixty, only fifty percent of the MKs were there. Less than sixty MKs. And I think 32 or three or four, 20 something were against it. Just a regular process, creating a regular law, but they call it a basic law. Okay. Three years later, 1995, our chief justice, the, the, the head of the Supreme Court, Aaron Barak, in a precedent, in a, in a, uh, um, he writes this tremendous piece, part of what's called Psak Din Banka Mizrahi, where he says back then in 1992, that basic law, of human dignity and liberty, that law has the authority of a constitution. It has the authority of a constitution, which means any law that contradicts that law will be canceled. And who will decide if a law contradicts that law? We do, obviously, the Supreme Court. So the thing is, um, so Misha El Cheshi, Misha El Cheshi was also a Supreme Court judge at the time. And he said, well, I'm all for a constitution and I'm all for human rights being protected by a constitution. And I'm all for any law that will contradict the constitution and violate human rights should be canceled. But shouldn't the process creating constitution be a little bit different? Like the, con the process creating a constitution that could cancel a regular law, shouldn't it be different than the, con the process creating a regular law? Maybe it won't go as far as the United States of America needing two thirds of the House, two thirds of the Senate, and seventy five percent of the states. But at least some kind of a greater majority, some kind of a shorter process, something. I mean, so because what you're saying, says Michel Cheshin to Aaron Barak in that debate in 1995, what you're saying is that the Knesset legislated a constitution and it didn't even know it was doing it. The people weren't involved. The most a uh, um, quiet constitution, the history of constitutions. <laughs> so what Aaron Barak said, he had this argument. He said, he, so he said, no, no, the people of Israel elected the Constitutional Conference in 1948. And then it decided it's not, it won't be the Constitutional Conference. It will just be a regular parliament, the Knesset. But the people, but that means in 1948, the people of Israel gave the Knesset the authority to create a constitution. So ever since then, the Knesset has what he calls two hats. One hat, the legislator, the Knesset. A second hat, the Asifa Mechonenet, the Constitutional Conference. It never used the second hat, but never gave up the right to use it. In 1992, it was wearing that hat, and it legislated the Constitution. So Mecheshin was, yeah, but they didn't say they're doing that. And it doesn't seem like they knew. There's a big debate that they know, or they not know. Anyway, so what happens was, in 1995, Michel, I mean, Aaron Barak does the following. He empowers the Knesset in order to weaken the Knesset. 
He says, the Knesset has the power to create a constitution. And as a result, that law, that basic law was a constitution. And now any law that contradicts it can be canceled by the Supreme Court. So by empowering the Knesset, he's weakening the Knesset and empowering the Supreme Law, the, the, the Supreme Court, to use the 1992 basic law of human rights to cancel any law in, in any law. Um, and then he does other things. He starts reading rights throughout the years. He read rights that are not that don't ex that are not written in that basic law into that law. So it's a double move. Uh, Michel Heshin said it's like magic. He retroactively turned the law into a constitution, and nobody knew about it. <laughs> yeah, and he started reading more into that law. So this is how the Supreme Court, in two moves in the 1980s, to the to the Attorney General. And the um, and the idea of if something's not reasonable, it's not legal. Through that, they kind of they kind of have tremendous control over the government, over the executive branch. And then through the 1995, what we call the constitutional revolution, that's what Barat called it. Um, now it now it could also cancel laws of the Knesset, and it takes and has tremendous control over the Knesset. Okay, so now this this process. Um, uh, oh, and by the way, a major part, component of this process is why I start with this, the attorney general, because you see the Israeli government is in charge of 90% of legislation. And the attorney general that advises the government what laws should they pass through the Knesset. But the attorney general said, you shouldn't pass a law through the Knesset if I think it will be canceled by the Supreme Court. So effectively, the government, effectively the Supreme Court canceled only 22 laws. But there were hundreds of laws that the Knesset didn't, didn't even try, that the government, sorry, didn't even try to pass through the Knesset because the Attorney General said it will not pass by the Supreme Court. So effectively, a lot of laws were, some laws were canceled, a lot of laws were not even passed because anybody was afraid of the Supreme Court canceling laws, comparing them to the way they interpret the basic laws of 1992. There's two laws of 1992, I won't go into it, uh, they, they compared to those laws. So that is the story of how. The Supreme, so, so the Supreme Court um, creates a lot, a lot of power, what we call, I think in Hebrew it's activism, shipudi, judicial activism, and it starts having a lot of influence, almost control over the two branches of the government. Now, now all this, in the beginning, when this was happening, it didn't interest many people. It was a very heated debate among lawyers, I mean, I mean uh, constitutional lawyers and academics, people like Ruti Gabizon, was against this, and Michel Chenchi, I mentioned like before, he was against this, and and uh, and the head of of, uh, of law department Tel Aviv University, Menachem Mautner, said Barak is going too far, and a, a very important uh, 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 professor at Hebrew University, Yoav Dotan. It was all academic debating where's the boundary of the Supreme Court. It wasn't political. Actually, most of the people that were against the Supreme Court be, be becoming so so large and affecting so many public decisions were usually people that were lived from the liberal left because it wasn't a right left decision uh, debate. It was like a nerdy professional uh, a debate among academics and lawyers. But then about a decade ago, this debate became a massive political debate where right wingers, it was right wingers versus, le versus, versus left wingers. And here's the narrative that was developed on the right. The narrative was like this. When did the power start shifting from the Knesset and the government to the Supreme Court? Which means from the bodies that are elected by the people to a body that was never elected by people. In Israel, the politicians, in Israel, the judges are never elected by, by, by civilians. So when did this happen, this shift of power? When did this process, well, it happened to happen after 77, after the left started losing elections. So a narrative started being created. A narrative, it's a semi-conspiracy theory, semi-maybe makes sense narrative, like it's hard to, um, which goes like this. Well, power started, well, once the, when the, ele the left couldn't get itself, lost its popularity because of many reasons, couldn't get itself elected to the Knesset. So what it did, it did, okay, well, we're not elected to the Knesset, but it doesn't matter. The power is not in the Knesset anymore. The Supreme Court, where people like us are still have a majority. So when you they couldn't get elected, they shifted the power to the body that doesn't need to get elected. That's the narrative on the right. And you can understand why they create a lot of frustration. And the right says, we just all we want is for the people, is a, is a government of the people, by the people, for the people. A government of the people, by the people, for the people. The people will vote for a government. 
and that government will implement the will of the people. We want the government to have power. And the Supreme Court, which wasn't elected by the people, it doesn't serve the people, shouldn't have so much power, shouldn't cancel the power of the government. And that narrative started creating a lot, a lot of um, um, frustration in the right. The frustration was built up, built up, built up, built up, and boom, it explodes. So here's a story. We have no constitution, so two things happen. One, Aaron Barak had swallowed so much power because there's no document saying, where, does, where is the power supposed to be? And two, with no constitution, now you can have a counter revolution where all this, the sense of frustration and maybe even vengeance exploding at this moment, a counter revolution to what Barak did, because again, there is no constitution telling you what you can do and what you can't do. So that is the story of the frustration of the right on Aaron Barak's revolution. And now this is the counter revolution, trying to cancel 40 years in four months, a slow process of 40 years. So now, it, now they're trying to cancel it radically and quickly in four months and hope that there won't be any unintended consequences. Okay, so that is the story of, I hope I was fair, trying to explain the frustration on the right and why there is a very legitimate and serious sense that Aaron Barak went too far, the judicial, the, the judicial system has way too much power, and the problem is the, the judicial system was never elected, and it takes power from the bodies that are elected, effectively taking power from us and the civilians from the people. Okay, that was argument number one. Um, before I move to argument, you know what, I'll move to argument number two and then I'll open this up a little bit. So argument number two, and, and by the way, I think everything I said is true. There is a serious problem of judicial activism in Israel in the past 40 years and power shifting from the elected bodies to non-elected bodies. It's a serious problem, makes people feel less empowered. That is true. What I'm going to say now is also true. Israel suffers from a serious democracy deficit. And our democracy deficit is a deficit in checks and balances. Now, this is so, I mean, what I'm going to share now is very, you know, this is all goes back to Ben-Gurion. But this is how in America, yeah, but so, so, so um, I just want to share very, very briefly the way I understand the basic theory of, of checks and balances and um, uh, div how do you call it? division of power. And, um, and that is that um, uh, as Plato asked 2,500, almost 2,500 years ago, a very important question. We need a strong government to protect us, to protect us from thieves, to protect us from murderers, to protect, to protect us from terrorists, to protect us from enemies. And if you even more to the left, to protect us from poverty, to protect us from, from, from ignorance, to protect us from, from disease, the government has to protect us. And for the government to protect us, it has to have power. But if the government protects us from enemies and has to have power to protect us from those enemies, the power that it uses to protect, to protect us can also be directed back at us, which means we need double protection. We need to be protected by the government. We also need to be protected from the government because if it has enough power to protect us, it also has enough power to attack us. And then how do you achieve that double protection? If you, it's a catch, because if you want to be protected from the government, you have to take power away from the government. But then the government can't protect you. So you give them power to protect you, and then you're not protected from the government. So how do you do it? So the great, great, um, uh, and probably maybe most important observation of Montesquieu and later on the great James Madison is that the way to protect us from the government with, and without taking away power from the government so it can protect us is through the idea of handing a lot of power to the government and then splitting the power among different branches. And now they'll start, they'll start now, at, they'll start competing between each other over the power. And this is Mad James Madison in the Federalist 51. He says that, or this is how I understand him. He says that our liberties will not be protected from the government because of the goodwill of the government, but because of the bad will of the government. Or let's put it differently, not because the government politicians will know how to restrain, to impose restraints on their ambition, but because they have no restraints on their ambition. It's their ambition. And so you, so because the ambition of every branch of governments 
They'll want more power and they'll be competing with each other on, on the power. So instead of them taking my rights, expanding their power to solve my rights, they'll be expanding their power, fighting for power between themselves. And then their battle over power is my liberty. That's the brilliant idea of checks and balances, handing power to government, splitting it, and, and enabling them to turn it against themselves and therefore not directed at us, at the civilians. Very, very powerful. That's James Madison, the father of your constitution, and the whole world go, you know, you know adopted this idea except for Israel. <laughs> so this is what we did. We have a very, very weak system, barely any checks and balances. It's kind of frightening. So here's how it goes. We have the Knesset and we have the government and we have the Supreme Court. That's all we have. That's all we have. But here is the thing. So in America, as in the United States, like you have, so like in Europe, if you're Europe, there's, there's um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, uh, vertical and horizontal checks and balances. If you're a country in Europe, so there's a check, there's a European Union. America, the, the, the United States is balanced by the states. That's, that's um, vertical, horizontal. You have the Congress and the Senate, the White House, the Supreme Court. They all have some form of veto power over each other. There's a constant, there's a constant battle over power and it's between the institutions and then their, their uh, uh, hunger for power is not directed at the civilians. What do we have in Israel? Well, I'll start uh, vertically, there's nothing. We don't belong to the EU. There's no like, there's no like uh, political, uh, political establishment that's larger than the state of Israel. And there's no political establishment that's smaller than the state of Israel. So there's no, so there's no vertical checks and balances. Horizontal, there's barely nothing. Here's how it goes. The Knesset does not, is, does not balance the government. You know why? Because the government can't, the government has automatic majority in the Knesset by definition. If it doesn't have 61, a majority of 61 in the Knesset, it doesn't exist. Because the way the government is formed, it has a majority of 61 in the Knesset. So if, if there is a government, it has an automatic majority in the Knesset. And even if those, any one of those MMKs weren't elected directly by Israelis, they were elected by the members of the government. So which are the ministers which formed the parties which populate the Knesset, which means the government has an automatic majority in the Knesset. So the Knesset does not balance the government. It's kind of like an extension of the government. By the way, in Israel, almost always, not always, the prime minister has control over the government because it could fire the ministers whenever it wants. And usually it has a majority there. So let's put it this way. The prime minister controls the government. The government controls the Knesset. Where's the checks and balances? There's only one body that could balance the government Knesset, and that is the Supreme Court. So we have an inherent deficit in checks and balances. What happens if the Supreme Court loses its power? Nothing could balance the government Knesset, nothing. So here you have it. Why is there so much anxiety in Israel today? People are afraid, well, the Supreme Court cannot cancel decisions of the Knesset. It cannot override decisions of the governments. If nothing can balance them, what's, who can protect our rights? Only one thing, the good will of the politicians. And even if you believe they have goodwill, that's not how you build a regime. Our, our human rights have to be protected through by systematically. There has to be a institution that protects that, 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 that protects our rights. And in Israel, the only institution that exists that can do that is the Supreme Court, is a whole is the court system. So here, so and that is what so here are two. So we understand both sides of the debate. Here are two statements that are correct. One in Israel, the Supreme Court tremendously it grew its grew in power. It was imperialistic, it was activist, and its power went way beyond its original informer, formal boundaries. And that created a sense that civilians vote for the Knesset, but there's no power in the Knesset and civilian feels like they're not, they're empowered, they're, they're disempowered. That narrative is true. Another, another narrative is that Israel was suffering from a deficit of checks and balances and the only institution that can balance it is the Supreme Court. And that is why they came in. And that is why they're so activist. And that is why they're so imperialist. So here you have the following debate. On the one side, citizens want to be empowered that's where I made a strong Knesset. 
The other side is our rights need to be protected. That's why we need a strong Supreme Court. And if we want to sit and if we want both our rights uh, as civilians to be empowered and as human beings to be protected, we want both. That means we need a very, we need to strike a balance between the Supreme Court and the Knesset. So that is, in a nutshell, the two sides of this very heated debate we're having in Israel for the first time in our history, not about how we play the game, but about what are the actual rules of the game. Um, that is trying to explain how we got to this moment. I want to now try to start explaining where do we go from this moment. But before we do that, I'll be happy to accept like uh, like a few questions, just so we could just so if there's anything that's troubling people, if something you want me to clarify, uh, I'll be happy to do that, and then we'll continue moving forward. Yeah, Micha, um, can you just address the question of why now? You said it's it's this has been a potential problem for 75 years, but it didn't rear its ugly head till now, and American Jews are wondering, isn't it because of the crime minister? Isn't it because Netanyahu wants to stay out of jail? And, and he's using this uh, constitutional crisis to get out of jail. So could you talk okay, about, I'll, I'll address yeah, that you talk about why now and, and about the corruption of the prime minister? Okay, so I'll discuss the BB question when we ask how moving forward. That's a part of like, about, about like, where do we go from here? That's a very big question. So if it's okay, Wes, I'll just continue. I'll keep, keep going, going okay? keep going, yeah. So, so this moment that we're in now is a very exciting moment and a very terrifying moment. It's an exciting moment because I, if you're in Israel now, you feel something different in the air. You see a awakening I've never seen before in my entire life. And what people suddenly care about are not the policies of the government, the structure of our regime. That's what people are caring about and talking about and accumulating literacy about these, these constitutional questions, which is very, very powerful. And, uh, but this is also very terrifying because I wanna share with you, first of all, there is a sense in Israel where if I wanna really express the anxiety of people more on the left, the people that are less, uh, uh, the, the, the people on the right want to be as civilians empowered. So they want the Knesset that they vote for to have power. People on the left saying, well, we didn't really get anybody, uh, we, we don't want as civilians to be empowered. We want as human beings to be protected, our rights to be protected. And this government seems like it's doing two things. One, it wants to change the regime where the Supreme Court is weaker and therefore our rights might not be protected at the end of this process, institutionally. At the same time, we hear different crazy things that are said by some people in this government, usually marginal, but they're still there. Uh, their policies they want to promote one day that will crush our rights. Like to wear what we want in the cult, like different things like, so, okay, so this is very, very terrifying. Now this anxiety is pushing people to say things that they've never said before. Like the most extreme things are like, we will say, well, if it takes it, we'll use a gun to protect our rights. Like we were saying things, like there's a rhetoric in the air I mean, many people are speaking about civil war. Let's put it this way. Like the idea of civil war is out there. Now, war, there could be... Now, civil war is not only... It's not just a metaphor, but I think there is, you know, there's a cold war like between the United States and Russia, and there's a warm war like between, you know, Iran and Iraq. So maybe, I don't know if it'll be a war. It could be warm. People could die, but it's because it's a cold war. Like people stop paying taxes. Like people not going to the military, like people resigning from the military. These are things, I'm not sure, like, like these are things, Israel is, Israel is a fragile country. And these things could, could, Israel could go into a spiral where very bad things happen. But what could trigger, what could trigger a civil war, a civil cold war is a constitutional breakdown. I want to walk you through a, the, the scenario of a constitutional breakdown. What happens if Yariv Levine's reforms are passed completely? which means effectively, de facto, canceling the ability of the Supreme Court to cancel decisions of the government and the Knesset. Okay. The next day, the Supreme Court convenes and has this big debate, or is the legislation of Yariv Levine legal? Is it constitutional? And I would say not with low probability, they'll vote and they'll say it's unconstitutional. 
So this is what they do, just follow me logically. The Supreme Court would cancel the, the decision of the Knesset to cancel the power of the Supreme Court to cancel the Knesset. You follow me? <laughs> okay. So where do we exist the day after that? Let's think about this. Now we have two universes in Israel, the universe of the government and the universe of the Supreme Court. According to the government, hey, we canceled the, 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 the power of the Supreme Court to cancel us. We're liberated from the Supreme Court. That's nice. That's fun. We're liberated. The Supreme Court is living in a different universe Universe because it canceled the, can the cancellation of their power to cancel. I hope you're following me. So now we have two universes. The universe where the Supreme Court says, hey, we could still cancel decisions of the government and the Knesset. And the, and the universe of the, of the government, the government saying now we're liberated and now the, the, the Supreme Court can't cancel us anymore. We're liberated from them. Okay, now we have two Israels. Now let's say the next day, um, our uh, beloved military, our, the IDS, is sent to a mission, I don't know, to evacuate a Bedouin illegal settlement in Area C in the West Bank or the Insum area. And they petition to the Supreme Court. That's, that's the most to protect their rights, their rights. That's how it works. And the Supreme Court reads into this and has a debate. So yeah, yeah, that decision of the Israeli government that sent the military to violates their basic human rights. And it says to the government, you can't do that. The government says to the Supreme Court, yeah, but you don't tell us what to do anymore. We canceled you, your ability to cancel us. So, 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 okay. So now let's say your name is Herzi Halevi, our amazing new chief of staff uh, a, a leader of our military, the head of our military. The Supreme, the, the government sent you to evacuate a pal a, some Bedouins in Area C. The Supreme Court told you you're not allowed to do that. The government says we don't listen to the Supreme Court anymore. The Supreme Court said, no, no, we canceled that. You do listen to us. <laughs> and let's say your name is Herzi Arevi. You're the, uh, you're the head of our military. Who do you listen to? The Supreme Court or to the government? Now, here's the tragedy. The question is not who is he going to listen to in the end, the government, the Supreme Court, because just the fact he faces that dilemma is the tragedy. Israel survived for 75 years without our chief of staff ever facing that dilemma. And the head of the FBI will face the same dilemma. And the head of the police will be facing the same dilemma. And whatever they do, the whole system collapses. I imagine that moment, that dilemma, as Ray, Ray Kurzweil imagines the moment of singularity. He's a futurist. He says one day when the AI will reach the level of human beings, that's the moment of singularity that beyond that, we can't predict anything. It's a black hole, like the, like the metaphor of a black hole, but on the other side is different laws of physics. So that moment where we're in a constitutional breakdown, we don't know who's the authority in Israel, that's the moment of singularity. That's the moment, that's the moment where all the laws of physics change. That's the, that could be, I, I, I don't think we'll get there, by the way. I don't think we'll get there. But we're only two steps away. We're so close. And that could be the beginning of the end. That could be the beginning of chaos. So, so I don't think we'll get there, but we're only two steps away. This reform approved and the Supreme Court canceling it. And then we are in a massive, massive constitutional breakdown. And this is not because of Levin, not because of Barak, because of Ben-Gurion. I'm not one of the people that want to blame Ben-Gurion over everything. I love Ben-Gurion, he's a giant and we owe him everything. So I don't want to say it's his fault, but it's because of him. <laughs> because they did not create a constitution when we have the, at the founding moment of Israel and we're playing a, a game with not knowing what the rules of the game are. And now, and that worked until the game was about the rules of the game themselves. So that's one possible, uh, uh, that's, poss that's very, very possible, but there is another possibility. And which I think is even, it's very exciting. And I think there's higher probability for a different possibility. This moment is pregnant with the possibility to create, to, 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 um, for, for us to have a constitutional moment. Now, con I was studying about this lately. Constitutional moments, the moment where a nation creates a constitution. It's never a regular moment. Because in regular days, we do politics as usual. We legislate, we debate policies. In order for us to debate, not the game, but the rules of the game has to have it. So a constitutional moment could happen either at the very beginning, like in regular countries, or when there's a crisis.
Like in the United States of America, you managed to amend the constitution only after great, like after civil war, right? You have to have a great crisis. Why? Because in the, in the beginning and after a crisis, there's a different awareness. When we start asking, not what's the game, what are the rules of the game? What's the, design, what's the structure of the entire regime? Now, here's the thing. Um, this moment has the quality, right now, the quality of a constitutional moment. Why? Because if I feel the flavor of this moment in Israel today, as we're talking, it has two components. One, People care. People are engaged. People are awakened. People are discussing the big questions of our regime. That's new. We never had that before. And that's potential. Israelis caring about the structure of a regime. That has potential. That's one. Two, Israelis agree. We all agree. That's the thing. Like 70% of Israelis, the polls show, agree. And this is what they agree. They agree that Aaron Barak went too far. And that Yariv Levine is way too radical. What they agree, and I try to, to, to articulate what Israelis agree on today. There's a great uh, Greek philosopher before Socrates called Heraclitus, Her Heraclitus. And he had this following image. He said that the entire cosmos is like the bow, you know, the bow and arrow. So the bow is like the, how do you call it to the, how do you say in English, the string of the bow? The thing that you, you know, that you stretch out to, to, to shoot the arrow. How do you call that string? In English, the string. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. So the string of the bow, in order for the bow to be effective, it has to be very, it has to be very stretched out, very tight, stretched out tightly. And for it to be stretched out tightly, both sides have to pull to the opposite directions as powerful as it can. All right. So Heraclitus says, when opposites pull to different directions that gives harmony to the universe. He said the universe is night and day, summer and winter. It's the harmony of opposites. That's what gives the, the, the cosmos is the string of the bow. It only works when both sides try to push as hard as they can to, 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 to different directions. I think that is a good image I use these days to explain to Israelis the ideal relationship between the Supreme Court and the parliament. We want to be empowered civilians to know that we vote for a body that has power. We need a strong Knesset. We want to have our rights protected. We need a strong institution to protect our rights. We need a strong Supreme Court. And it contradicts each other. Exactly. That contradiction, if both institutions are very powerful, they'll be fighting for power. And as a result, the string of the bow of reality will be stretched. And that battle of power between the Knesset and the Supreme Court is a headache, it's a headache for them. But their headache is our liberty. What happened was that that balance, that tension between the two institutions was violated in 1995 by Aharon Barak. It was violated because people don't like tensions. People like to know, people like want clarity. So he gave way too much power to the Supreme Court. Yariv Levine doesn't want to restore the lost balance what he wants to do is to replicate the lack of balance but this time the lack of balance won't be for the supreme court will be towards the knesset you know what most israelis want they want the balance itself not the violation of balance towards the supreme court Aharon Barak. not the new violation of balance towards the knesset towards the knesset but we want to have to be empowered civilians and human rights and it's and the and it's messy, and we need the two institutions to represent them to be strong in the battle between them to be very heated. That's what we want. We want the ten not to solve the tension, we want to create the tension itself. That's what most Israelis want. Now, how does it look like? There is a very there is a basic law that most Israelis can agree on, and it's called the Hokis of the Hakika, the basic law of legislation, which it's a basic law that for the first time in Israel history defines the rules of the game. What, what's the majority to create a law? What's the majority to create a basic law? It has to be a different majority, a very different majority. What majority does the Supreme Court have to cancel a law of the Knesset? And what majority, and it can't be a regular majority, and what majority does the Knesset have to have in order to cancel 
the intervention of the Supreme Court. It has to be a massive majority, not 61, 70, 80, whatever. So, and that is Choki Sobel Chakika. And the idea is the basic law of legislation. And that's the rules. All we have is basic law defining powers of the different institutions, but not the relationship between them. That's the missing piece for us to have the rules of the game. And because of this moment, I want to add these two components. Israelis are awakened. They care. They're engaged. One component. Two, they agree. The invisible agreement. 60, 70 percent of Israelis agree on the equation. I'll just share with you. You put that together, the the very clear and visible engagement and the invisible agreement, you put it together, what we have is a constitutional moment. And once we have a constitutional moment, once we have the rules of the game, Israel will pull off the impossible. Instead of having a constitution giving birth to a democracy, we'll have a democracy giving birth to a constitution. We reversed it, we're Israelis, we reared, but we were reared and we did it. And it's fair to say, it's fair to say that when, when that, a country is only really created and established once it has a constitution. So if that's true, so Israel is not created yet. Israel is still in the for, is, is still going through the process of being created. It's like we look down at the good old days when Israel was formed, what, what, what was in the process of formation. It's not nostalgia. It's not Israel wasn't. We're not looking back to the days where Israel was formed. Today, Israel is in the process of being formed. And if we have the basic law of legislation the most dietetic version of constitution. We know the rules of the game. I think it'll be fair to say the process of Israel being formed has ended and Israel is formed, Israel is real. And, and we could reach that moment by this independence day. So we have, so this is a pregnant moment and it could lead to constitutional breakdown or to a constitutional moment. Constitutional breakdown could lead to the beginning of collapsing of Israel. But a constitutional moment will lead to the end of the process of the creation of Israel. And we don't know where this is going. That's why this moment is exciting and terrifying. Michael, um, first of all, yes. thank you, thank you, thank you. I mean, we have no words. Um, I, I just want to talk about, I want to come back to the fact that we don't trust Bibi. We don't trust Bibi. If, you know, and, and Bibi wants to stay out of jail. He's got, you know, he's got his own personal self-interest here. And also the fact, from what we read, you know, like the open letter that your colleagues, uh, Danny Gordas and uh, Mati Friedman and Yessi Klein Halevi wrote, they talk about uh, these are such complex issues. They require time and thoughtful deliberation. And instead, Bibi is pushing this through without deliberation, without a conversation, without the reflection, because he wants to stay out of jail. Can you talk about the Bibi angle? So I think what I'm thinking about now. If Israel is going, we both saying the word civil war is being said too many times, but I'm fine with that. You want to use the word, the word war, civil war, fine. But that, that gives us the right to use another word, word peace. Because once there's war, there's peace. So if we're going into civil war, let's start imagining what the peace agreement between the Jews, between Israelis, between us, what does a peace agreement look like on the other side of the civil war? And then I want to ask, okay, now, after we close our eyes and imagine what will the peace agreement look like, the peace agreement that we'll have between us, between the Jews, after the war, then I want to ask, you know what? If that's the peace agreement after the war, let's be smart and make that agreement between ourselves before the war, before civil war. Instead of a peace agreement being after civil war, as a result of civil war, let's make it before the civil war to prevent the civil war. So here's how that peace agreement looks like. This is what I think it looks like. It has three components. One, Complete exoneration for Netanyahu. Is exoneration the word? Is exoneration the word, Hanina? Am I saying it right? Yeah, okay. A complete exoneration for Netanyahu. And people will say, that's corrupt. How dare you say that? That's not pure. That's against the law. That's okay. You're right. You're right. You're right. I have a question. For peace of the Palestinians, are you, willing to, are you willing to split Jerusalem? Some of you are, right? You're willing to make very serious, hard, impossible concessions for peace with the Palestinians. What are you willing to do for peace with Jews? I mean, because for peace of Palestinians, we're willing to give up things we believe in, right? Peace is messy. Peace means that you give up something you believe in, your principles, some of your principles. So we're willing to give up so much for peace of Palestinians. I think we should also be able to give up for peace between Jews. The Netanyahu case is creating so much turbulence in Israel, has created so much division in Israel. And I think in the ideal world, the court, the, and the, we're not in an ideal world. Ideal. So number one, complete exoneration for Bibi. Number two, constitution for all of us. Number three, unity. That's the formula. 
exoneration, constitution, unity. What does unity mean? Unity means Benny Gantz joins the government, Ben Gvir and Smotrich leave the government, and then we have a national unity government without extremists that can go do peace with Saudi Arabia, shrink the conflict with the Palestinians, and stabilize Israel. Exoneration, constitution, unity. Yes, that's the peace agreement. And what I'm saying is, yeah, does Baby get, deserve that? I don't know. That's not the question. That's not because we're not living in a theoretical world. We're living in a real, real world, and we might be going into civil war. And I, so, so I want to create the movement called Peace Now. Peace Now. By the way, when it comes to Israelis and Jews, I don't want to shrink the conflict. I want to end the conflict. I want a peace treaty. And I want it now. Now before civil war. And if we're going to read it, the same, so the same peace treaty will reach anyway after civil war. Let's have that peace treaty right now before civil war. Three components, constitution, exoneration, unity. And that's the idea, that, that's the idea I want to promote in Israel. That's the idea. We have to bring peace now, peace now to Israel. We can't wait. So, so the question is not like, okay, may, is Bibi corrupt? It's a, that, that question, is Bibi corrupt? is a question that's the divided Israel roughly 50-50 and triggered the big, big, it triggered the process that led to this moment. So if we really want peace, not with Arabs, not with the Palestinians, but within us, between Jews, peace comes with concessions. And if you're willing to split Jerusalem for peace, maybe you're willing to shut down Netanyahu's cases for peace or his great concessions only there for Palestinians, not for Jews. But if we really want peace, and, and we need peace and peace now. If Israel, if the miracle call, we have to understand two things. One, Israel is a miracle. And two, Israel is fragile. It's a fragile miracle. It could get lost. And this is the moment of this fight. We're going to constitutional moment or constitutional crisis. And both sides have to reach a peace treaty before civil war, not after civil war. And yet the BB issue is something the left and the people and the elite, it's something we have to give up. We have to give up on exoneration, constitution, unity. And Micha, have you socialized this idea with the media in Israel? Like, what, what would the 70% of Israelis who agree rough and tough, what would they say about your idea? My bet, my bet is that this peace initiative is a peace initiative that majority of Israelis, if it were to be put, if, if it were taken to referendum, majority of Israelis would vote for this peace initiative, which probably brings me to the biggest absurd. Israelis agree. They agree on most of these issues. They agree. So this is the Israeli paradox where we're polarized in the streets. We hate each other in social media and we agree in the polls. <laughs> That's Israel. We're divided in social media. We're divided in the streets. We agree in the polls. So if this does lead to civil war, I don't think it will, by the way. But if it does lead to civil war, it will be the most absurd civil war of all civil wars. The civil war between civilians that agree with each other. Now, that's, that's, a, tra I mean, that's a tragedy. I'm not willing for, I, I, we, we shouldn't go into that tragedy. The peace, that, the, the peace agreement of the, that will reach after civil war, we should be reaching right now, this week, before civil war. So, yeah, I do think many, so the question is, the question is, I, th I think in the end, this, what I'm discussing, these three components of the big Israeli compromise, the real peace treaty between Israelis, I think some kind of a version of this might be reached within the next few weeks. Um, I just hope we won't have to suffer a lot of pain. I, I, I so, usually people become smart after pain. Maybe for the first time you can become smart before, which takes me by the way to another point. The curse of the eighth decade. In the Bible, according to Sefer Melachim, the kingdom of the kingdom of David lasted for 73 years. His son Solomon inherited him, and then the ex, and, and then the eighth decade, the kingdom split to Israel and Judea. Hundreds of years later, we had our second chance on sovereignty. That was the sovereignty of the Hashmonim, the Hasmoneans, the Hanukkah story. It lasted for 70 something years before it split into civil war. It's the curse of the eighth decade. I always used to be cynical about the idea of the curse of the eighth decade. Yeah, it happened in the past, it's not gonna happen again. And here we are, eighth decade, the curse is hitting us and might be split among ourselves in the eighth decade. The curse is back. But this time with absurdity, we're 
Israel is split between Israelis that agree with each other. They just not, they just don't really know that they agree with each other. But that's that that's the absurdity of this moment. So here's what I say. I say we could Israel, the third time around, we could pull it off. We could survive the curse of the eighth decade. And you know why we can be better than our past? Because we have one advantage over the past. We have the past. The people of the past didn't have the privilege of having a past to learn from. We do. And so that's what I'm saying. The peace treaty of the future, let's make in the present. The, the lessons of the past, let's learn in the present. That's the big challenge of this moment. Wow. And, and blaming people, bl I mean, I, I, oh, by the way, polarization has, has a tendency to expand as we talk about it. Because when people are polarized, this is how they say, hey, how do we get this? How do we, how do we get here? So this is what people always do. They blame the other side. You know why we're polarized? Because of the other side. So right wing we say, you know why we're polarized? Because of the left, because of Aaron Barak. The left is saying, you know why we're polarized? Because of the right, because of Bibi. Okay, fine. So by trying to understand why we're polarized, we get more polarized. The process of understanding polarization itself increases polarization. So I don't want to play that game. I don't want to ask why we're polarized. I want to ask how we end polarization. And we end war with peace. But this peace treaty I'm offering, I think we should try to create before war, not as a result of war. Yeah. And Micha, have you written this up and shared it in Israel? The, the Rabbi, that you're doing here. Yeah. Rabbi, there's 212 people. This is the first public space I'm sharing this idea. You're the, you're, the, I'm practicing on you all. This is the first right. time I'm sharing this idea for peace now, not peace later, not shrieking the conflict, ending the conflict, peace now. This is the first time. Yes, I mean, behind the scenes, I'm, I'm sharing this idea, but publicly not yet. I've been speaking, by the way, I'm very loud. I'm speaking a lot about Israel about this reform and I'm against this reform, by the way, but the idea of how to, how not to shrink the conflict, how to solve the conflict, the idea of peace now, the idea of learning from our past, the, that idea, this is the first time I'm sharing with this, this idea with its three components, constitution, exoneration, and unity. Wow, uh, Micha, thank you, thank you. I know that there have been a lot of comments. Amy, do you wanna just, in the interest of time, read two comments and then we'll close up. And again, Micha, thank you. Uh, Micha, I have one quick clarifying question and then one big question. The clarifying question is, how are Supreme Court judges chosen right now? Is the first question. I'll let you do that one first. The second one is bigger. It's complicated. I think in 1953, from 19, I might not get the dates right. I think it was in 1953 and 2007 or eight, the process was that there was a committee and the majority of the committee effective majority of the committee was of Supreme Court judges. And and so they kind of like a, a appointed themselves. Okay. So uh, that, that, that was the system. <laughs> like, um, and then ever since 2007 or eight, you don't sound reformed that a bit. And now the committee has, uh, there is politicians and there is judges and there's members of the bar. Don't ask me that it was even there before. And effectively, politicians could veto any decision of the judges. The judges have veto power over the, effective veto power. It's, it's not official, effective veto power over the politicians. So any candidate is a, somehow a compromise between what the elected people want, the politicians, and the judges want. It's very different than the way you have it, where it's only politicians choose the judges, but it's politicians with 20 different branches, the president and the Senate. Here we have politicians and judges. That's how it works today. In Levine's reform, what he wants is the politicians to elect the judges. And then those politicians could cancel decisions of the, of the judges, which is very, 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 very radical because it effectively cancels the balance of power in Israel. Thanks for that. Um, the other question is really a couple of people have asked, who are the leaders that could push this idea, this Peace Now initiative forward? It's one part of it. And the other is, what's to keep the right from exercising their power and saying, hey, we love this instability. What's to hold them in check? So, By the way, I think we liked your idea. How do you make it happen? Uh, well, for, for ideas to happen, we need, I, I mean, I think the key person here is Bibi Netanyahu. The key person is Bibi Netanyahu. Bouzi Herzog, which in 15 minutes is having a very important speech. That's where we have to finish soon. Has a very important speech, Bruce Herzog. And I'll be speaking about calling people. I mean, I think what we really need is the following. Our 
for us to have a constitutional moment, we need a our Philadelphia moment to happen now. Your Philadelphia moments gave birth to your democracy, our democracy is to give birth to our Philadelphia moments, to our constitutional conference. And it looks like this, Bougie Herzog calls for a constitutional conference. People from all sides convene. Um, it won't be like, you know, you had, it will be pretty, it will be short. And they have to agree on on the rules of the game. And then they take that to the Knesset and the Knesset votes, let's say with 70 mandates, that means that um, we have finally rules of the game, which were broadly accepted. 70 mandates, 70, 50, you know, that's 120. That's pretty impressive. For that to happen, you need Gantz to agree to do this. You need Benny Gantz to agree. Benny Gantz to say, you know what? I'm saving the day. I'm breaking the dichotomy. And this, is, this seems like if there's a, a, a constitutional conference and it comes up with something reasonable that restores the balance between the branches, doesn't violate the balance, towards the Knesset, restores it, um, for it, he votes for it, we have a constitution. Um, and then we'll probably, that, what will probably happen, Ben Gvir will leave the government because Bibi sold out and he's a leftist and he, and then Gantz will join and we have the element of unity. So we have to go through a conference. I think for that to happen, we need Bibi to want it. We need to persuade Bibi and we need the public to push for this. And so we need like a movement right now there is a class between the people who are against the reform and people who are for reform. But I think we didn't hear yet the Israelis that are for a reform, just not this reform. And those are mostly Israelis and their voice is not heard yet. So I think that combination of BB getting it and a massive and the people calling for it. That's, I think, that's, I think it's, and by the way, it's very hard to, I mean, this idea was just, I, I started thinking about this in Shabbat. And things are so quick in Israel. So it's, it's very, very, it will be very hard to get this through uh, because Yossi and, and Danny, Gord, uh, Danny Gordon, Samantha Freeman are right. This government is doing it very, very quickly. But, but here's, you see, Bibi is a very, very smart person. And you can say a lot of things about him. He's very, very smart. And remember back in 2020, there was a moment where we thought Israel was about to annex 30% of the West Bank to the in Samaria. And that annexation created a lot of anxiety, a lot of anxiety. There was a sense that the West Bank will burst out. There was a sense of hyperpolarization in Israel. There was a sense that, that uh, Israel will, will be isolated in Europe. There was a sense that, that, that Jordan will leave their, uh, their peace treaty with Israel. It was very, very bad. There was a lot, a lot of anxiety. And people were asking, how do we stop annexation? How do we stop annexation? And then suddenly, instead of annexation, we had peace. And what Bibi did, he turned all, he transformed all the anxiety into opportunity. Here we have it again. There's a lot of anxiety. The anxiety is creating awareness and agreement. People are saying, you know what? Maybe Barak did to go too far. Not Levine, not that radical reform. We have to do something. And that's how this moment was created, where there's awareness and agreement. It was created because of the anxiety. If BB smart, he'll capture this anxiety and turn it into opportunity. From constitutional crisis to constitutional moments. We need this for BB to recognize that he has that moment again, from, a, from annexation to, to peace, from, from, from breakdown to constitution. He needs to realize, so we need Bibi to get that, that's on the one hand, and the people to rally that, so Gantz will feel that he has what to gain politically from joining this. Those are the two components, I think, for this to happen, for us to have peace now. Well, Micha, we cannot thank you enough for what a urgent, timely, important, compelling conversation. You've given us so much to think about, and we're so grateful for this really thoughtful, privileged glimpse. And uh, may Hashem just give you the strength to do your good work to create peace now in our beloved Eretz Yisrael. We love you. Micha. Thank you so much. We'll see you in March, and uh, may Hashem prosper all your worthy endeavors. Thank you, guys, and thank you all for being on this call. March 20th at Temple Emanuel, Michael Goodman in the Rabbi Samuel Cho Sanctuary. If you're here, join us. Thank you, guys. Take care of Michael. Thank you, Michael. Bye.